Welcome to our daily devotion. The Methodist Church of Barbados invites you to sing, pray, and worship with us as we declare God's glory and celebrate His mighty acts. The void of the night Our God is an awesome God He spoke into the darkness And created the light Our God is an awesome God Judgment and wrath He poured out on Sodom Mercy and grace He gave even sent the cross Hope that you have not Too quickly forgotten That our God is an awesome God Our God is an awesome God He raised from heaven above with them Let us pray. Great God and our Heavenly Father, we come again into your wonderful presence. We come to worship and adore you and to hear from you. We think of the words of that beautiful Psalm, Psalm 8, that tell us how excellent and how majestic and glorious is your name in all the earth. Words that remind us again of your awesome creative power as revealed in the heavens, in the moon, and in the stars. We are called to contemplate on why such a wonderful, mighty God would give any consideration to us human beings to love and care for us. 
and yet you do, crowning us with glory and honor. Yet in spite of all of this, we confess, Lord, that we so easily lose sight of who you are, of all you have done for us. We often go about our own way without a word of thanks and gratitude, without remembering you have bestowed on us honor and glory and dominion over your creatures. We often turn away from you in pursuit of our own selfish desires and passions. We follow gods of our own making. For all this, Lord, we humbly ask your divine forgiveness. As we come with penitent hearts, we ask that you forgive us and renew our mind to right thinking and relationship with you. We thank you that in your love for us, we keep receiving, you keep receiving us back to yourself again and again, for that is how great your love toward us is. And so we come to you again, giving you thanks and praise as we rejoice in the restoration you so freely offer us. We pray that our lives will so glorify your name, that others who see and hear us will be drawn to you, will come to see and know you as their wonderful, loving, gracious Father. We pray, Lord, that your hand of love and mercy and provision will be revealed to all people suffering loss of any kind through all kinds of diseases, through bereavement and unemployment and natural disasters, especially in relation to the volcanic eruption in St. Vincent. We show, show your hand mighty to save in whatever situation may overtake us, Lord. And your praises, let them be continually on our lips, no matter what. All this we ask in the wonderful name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, and soon coming King. Amen. lesson comes to us from Isaiah chapter 40, 
you need to read from verse 12 through to verse 25. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has directed the spirit of the Lord, or as his counselor has instructed him? Whom did he consult for his enlightenment, and who taught him the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Even the nations are like a drop from a bucket, and are accounted as dust on the scales. See, he takes up the isles like fine dust. Lebanon would not provide fuel enough, nor are its animals enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness compare with him? An idol? A workman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold, and casts for it silver chains. As a gift one chooses mulberry wood, wood that will not rot, then seek so a skilled artisan to set up an image that will not topple. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in, who brings princes to naught and make the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth. When he blows upon them and their wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me? Or who is my equal? Says the Holy One. This is the word of the Lord. reflection for tonight is God awesome in power, awesome in love and compassion. 
And so I speak to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And may each word go forth with the anointing of Holy Spirit, such that it touches every heart of every hearer and draws him and her into a closer and deeper relationship with our wonderful, mighty, powerful God. Amen. Questions, questions, questions. Questions are a normal part of our everyday lives. We hear questions between parents and children, especially three-year-olds and teenagers. Teachers and students, at interviews for job employment, for mortgage loans, for surveys, for lawyers and witnesses, between doctors and patients. We are all familiar with questions and questioning. Isaiah 40 is a chapter which raises one question after another in quick succession. Beginning at verse 12, let us take another look at the first set of questions asked. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and marked off the heavens with a span, and enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or as his counsellor has instructed him? Whom did he consult for his enlightenment, and who taught him the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge, and showed him the way of understanding? When Isaiah the prophet, through the direction of God, posed these questions to the Jews in exile in Babylon, he was not waiting for an answer. These questions were not meant to challenge the knowledge of the hearers. Every Israelite would have automatically known the answer to these rhetorical or self-answering questions. I am bold to say that if you and I take these questions as being directed to each one of us here and now, we too would be impacted in the same way in which the exiles in Babylon were impacted by them. For we too, like them, know straight up that these questions refer directly to God and no one else. These questions bring a startling reminder of who God is. As the answers to these questions surface in our memory, we too are jolted into acknowledging again the power of our awesome, almighty God. The Israelites, this nation especially chosen by God, had for generations experienced the miraculous works through the mighty power of God as he rescued them from Egypt as he preserved them in the desert, as he defeated their enemies and drove them out of the land promised to them through their ancestor Abraham. They had quaked in fright at the foot of Mount Sinai when God descended on the mountain and his voice thundered from the depths of the cloud along with the billowing smoke and lightning as his presence engulfed the mountain. Yet these people had repeatedly turned away from their one true God of such awesome power to follow the way of pagans and to make and worship false gods of wood and stone. The Israelites believed firmly the reason for their exile in Babylon was God's judgment for their repeated spiritual adultery, their disloyalty to him. No wonder this question was asked of them in verse 18 and 19. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? An idol? Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? Do you not begin to grasp 
the awesomeness of God? Although these questions were addressed to the Israelites, God's chosen people, so many years ago, I say to us that they are asked of us his church today. We need to pause and take time to consider such questions as these. For these questions are meant to jolt us, to pull on our heartstrings, to bombard our consciences, to begin to stir in us a new consciousness of how awesome and mighty is our God. Lest we forget. Lest we forget. Lest we too, like the Israelites, slip to that place where we can so easily take God for granted. So how do we, the members of God's church, compare with the Israelites? Is it that many of us today, like the Israelites, have forsaken our God? Have we created and now worship idols of our own making? For idols today are much more subtle than in Old Testament time and can misguidedly be seen as good. For example, we work diligently and hard to create wealth, fame, status, a good-looking physique, a beauty queen appearance, to acquire academic degrees of all kinds, high prestigious jobs wherever possible, fine life based on the acquisition of material things. Nothing wrong with this activity. But in the process, there is often a subtle, gradual erosion of the prominence of God in our lives, in our zeal for God, in the time we spend with God. The place of God in our hearts and in our lives takes a far second place to the busyness of the lifestyle we now lead and the things we have set our hearts on. And what is so dangerous about this is that we do not realize it is idolatry. It has supplanted God in our lives. So we worship at the feet of the idols we have created for ourselves. We have lost our way in the maze of life as we now unwittingly worship these seemingly harmless false gods. Even in the body of the church, this is happening. In Revelation 2 verse 4, after commending the church at, at Ephesus for their hard work and perseverance, we hear Jesus saying to them, But you have abandoned the passionate love you had for me at the beginning. Think about how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works of love you did at first. We may still be coming to church, but church busyness may have replaced our love for God and has become our idol. Our love for God no longer holds the highest place in our lives, in our worships. Like the Israelites, we are in a state of exile from God. Isaiah not only raised thought-provoking questions as directed by God, but also forcefully reminded the Jews of God's greatness with statements such as those found in verses 22 and 24. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. Its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a curtain. He brings powerful world leaders to nothing. They are here today and gone tomorrow just like that. These statements say so much. God enthroned above the earth, seeing everything everywhere. Grasshoppers. Who? You? Me? Just pause for a moment and think how we view a grasshopper. Yes, 
That is what God says we are in comparison to him. This should be a very sobering thought. What can we answer to God's question as he, that he asked of the Israelites then? To whom will you liken me? Or to whom shall I be equal? says the Holy One. We are invited to look up into the heavens, into the night sky, and observe all the hosts of stars he has created, each one of which he knows by name, each one of which is accounted for. We are again reminded that our God, who is from everlasting to everlasting, created the ends of the earth, and never gets weary has understanding that is far beyond our discerning, never becomes weary, nor ever collapses and have a blackout. He needs no sleep. The sum total of all of this is to remind us again most vividly of the incomparability of our powerful, mighty Creator God, holy and distinct from any other being. Many of the songs and hymns we sing remind us of this truth. There is none like you. What a mighty God we serve. How great is our God. Our God is awesome. How great thou art. God and God alone. Brothers and sisters, this is our God. Omnipresent, omniscient, righteous, eternal, Alpha and Omega, unchanging, awesome. Should not we mere grasshoppers, we the grass of the field that quickly withers and whose flowers fade at the breath of God, should not we come into the presence of this God with great awe and wonder and holy fear? Total awesomeness, total awe. Yet there is another attribute of God that is unmatched by anything else in all creation. I speak now about his awesome love, compassion, and tender mercy for us human beings. He knows our frame. He knows that by comparison to him, we are dust. Yet he loves us with an immense, deep, unfathomable, and eternal love. And God does not love us from a distance. This great, awesome God did the imaginable. He laid aside his glory. He left his throne in heaven. He laid aside his kingly crown and all his glory to come down to earth in human form in the same form as us grasshoppers, to demonstrate his love for us. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, came and lived among us to show us in visible ways how much he or God loves us. Can love be more visible? Then in the way Jesus went around, healing all manner of diseases, casting out evil spirits, breaking demonic holes over persons that kept them in physical and spiritual bondage. He did this in the synagogues, in homes, in streets, in towns, in the country, by the seaside. He fed the hungry. He embraced the outcasts, the rejects of society, the lepers, the blind, the crippled, the poor, the destitute. He reached out to the cheating tax collector, the adulterer, and the prostitute. He reached out then. He reaches out now. He is still reaching out now. God's awesome love for us never shone more brightly than when Jesus hung on the cross, taking our punishment for our sin that we have committed against him. We just reflected a few weeks ago on this, on Good Friday. We saw the lengths to which God went to show his love for us, grasshoppers. 
He gave his back to the smiters who beat him mercilessly. He gave his face to those who yanked out his beard. He exchanged his crown of glory for a crown of thorns, his magnificent train that Isaiah saw in his vision for a bloodstained purple robe. He died the most horrible death on the cross as he offered us pardon and redemption for our sin which separates us from him so we can return from exile into oneness and unity with him so that we are no more th- who are no more than dust can obtain immortal glorified bodies and live with him in his glorious kingdom in eternity forever and ever such love is immeasurable such love boggles our human mind this is god's awesome love and compassion for the human race that provides us the opportunity to transform into the beautiful creation we once were and can be again into royalty into his beautiful princes and princesses for we are the sons and daughters of the most high god what is our response to the awesome and incomparable love god holds out to us to our restoration to reflect his beautiful image in us as we reflect on this can we come with deep humility into the presence of our amazingly wonderful God? Can we pull down every idol we have created and let him be God and God alone of our lives? Our God is an awesome God, but this God loves us immensely. This God wants to be truly our Father. This God wants to be God in our hearts. I close with these verse from Hebrews 12, 28 to 29. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks by which we offer to God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For indeed, our God is a consuming fire. Our God, awesome in power. Our God, awesome in love. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen.
May the Lord, mighty God, bless and keep you forever. Grant you peace, perfect peace, and courage in every endeavor. Lift up your eyes and see God's face, full of grace forever. May the Lord, mighty God, bless and keep you forever. And our brothers and sisters, may you run and not be weary. May you rise up on the wings of eagles. May you know without doubt that the everlasting God goes with you. Amen. of our daily devotion we trust it has been a blessing to you now together let us hold fast to his word and may it dwell in all of us richly <laughs>